Hello everyone and welcome to the Tank Club. Today we're going to be going over my Affinity 1 bar Dragon Knight tank build for the High Isle patch. Now 1 bar tank builds are something that some players might really like or need for a number of different reasons. Uh, we've already got a lot of other meta builds, we've got a lot of normal tank builds. This is something for people who really want to go with this 1 bar kind of setup. Now going with a 1 bar build does limit your um, ability as a tank, it does limit some of the things that you're able to do. However, gen like generally, you are able to tank using one bar. So firstly, we're going to take a look at the race for this build. I have gone with a red guard. This is because, as I said, we are very limited on our ability as a tank. We are limited on bar space by using one bar. So we have to try and achieve the best results possible with the tools that we have. I've gone with a red guard tank. And this is so we can reach the sustain that we need to make this work. We don't have enough bar space to slot things like balance. We need to have the sustain benefits of the red guard so that we can do what we need to do. You can use whatever race you want. Other good races would obviously be Nord, Imperial, Argonian. Those kind of things would be good as well. But I have gone with red guard. For the red guard, it's very useful. We've got increased the duration of any eaten food by 15 minutes. So that's going to help you out there with your Bewitch Sugar skills. Martial Training is going to reduce the cost of your weapon abilities by 8% and reduce the effectiveness of snares by 15%. So both very useful. Conditioning is going to give us 2k more max stamina. And Adrenaline Rush. When you deal damage, you restore 1,000 stamina. This effect can occur once every 5 seconds. So most of our skills are going to cause damage when we taunt. That's damage. That's going to give us 1,000 stamina back. So we're able to proc this to get some more resources back. This is not quite as useful as using it on a 2-bar build, because on a 2-bar build, when we put down our blockade, for example, this is just going to constantly make this tick on cooldown. That is not the case in this situation. However, we are still going to get good benefits from doing this. In terms of our consumables, we are using Bewitch Sugar Skull's food. I mean, using tri-stat potions. The reason we use both of these is we want to max out as many stats as we can and as many recoveries as we can. We're trying to really, really hit high numbers on everything so that we're able to do our job as a tank. Onto our character sheet. So as you can see, my attributes are 20 into Magicka, 15 into Health, and 29 into Stamina. That gives me some stats of 23.6k max Magicka, 37k max Health, and 27.9k max Stamina. With our resistances, we are at 29k Spell and 28k Physical. More than enough for pretty much all content in the game. For our recovery, if we buff up, 2.3k Magicka Recovery, 1.5k Health Recovery, and 1k Stamina Recovery. On our advanced stats, we've got a 767 block cost and a 73% block mitigation. For our Munderstone, the Atronarch Munderstone for the extra 310 Magicka Recovery. So if we now have a look at our gear, and we're going to have a little look at some different options as well that you could use if you wanted to. So we've got, first of all, we've got the Yolnacrin gear set. Now the reason I've chosen Yolnacrin is because when you taunt the enemy, it's going to provide a buff. And so it's purely for the fact that there's limited amounts of micromanagement required, which makes this a very good set. So I would assume for most players that would want to go with a one bar build, there are like some kind of reason why you would choose a one bar build over a standard two bar build. And so we want to make this as simple to use as possible by using gear sets that require very little micromanagement. So here we've got the Yolnacrin gear set. We're going to get 1206 max health, minor Aegis reducing our damage taken by 5%. 1096 max stamina. If you've got this imperfected, we get an additional 1206 max health. And then when you taunt an enemy, you give yourself and 11 group members minor courage for 15 seconds. And you can do this every 8 seconds as well. So for the Yolnacrin set, we're using it on the one hand and the shield. We're also using it on the helmet, the neck, and the ring. The Yolnacrin set can be picked up in the Sunspire Trial. You don't have to do this on Veteran. You can just do it on Normal and get the non-perfected. That is fine as well. The next gear set is the Pearlescent Ward set. You might have noticed that already with the orbs floating around. That's the visual for this gear set. This set comes from the Dread Sail Reef trial, the new trial with High Isle. And again, we're using this set because of the minimal amounts of, well, the non-existent amounts of micromanagement required to keep this active. So if we have a little look, 
1206 max health. We have got a double stacked minor Aegis, which some people frown upon, but at the end of the day, the most important thing about gear sets is generally the five piece. So having a one wasted three piece is okay because we are benefiting hugely from the five pieces here. We get the 4% healing taken. We get an additional 1206 max health with the perfected version. And then the five item bonus is the interesting part. So grants you and up to 11 other group members per lesson ward. Uh, this bonus persists through death. So if you're dead, you will still provide these buffs to your group. So per lesson ward increases weapon and spell damage by up to 180 based on the number of group members that are alive. So when everybody is alive, you're going to give 180 weapon and spell damage to yourself and your group. This is within 28 meters. Pearlescent Ward increases damage reduction from non-player enemies out of 66% based on the number of group members that are dead. So if somebody dies in your group, you're going to start to get damage reduction. If you're the only person alive in your group and everybody else has died, you're going to be taking 66% less damage. So, depending on the amount of people that are dead and your group size, you're going to have damage reduction, which is going to be really, really useful in situations where you might be progressing content or doing random dungeons and things like that. So this gear set is just active. You don't have to do anything. It's there the entire time. And that's the strength of using it, is you don't have to do anything. So we're trying to avoid having to do too many things to proc gear sets here because we're trying to make it so that it's easy to use for all players to be able to pick up and just play it. For the Pearlescent Ward set, we've got it on the chest, the waist, the hands, the legs, and the feet. The next piece of gear we've got is the Magma Incarnate Shoulder. And for this, you are just going to get the one piece bonus. So the 129 Magic Recovery and the 129 Stamina Recovery. Additionally, you could just use a one piece Chokethorn, a one piece Shadow Rend, or any one piece that you like the look of. Maybe you want more health, maybe you want more stats. You could use a one piece Swarm Mother. That's going to give you max Stamina and Magicka. It's really up to you. I like the additional recovery. And the final gear piece is the old console ring. So whenever you're doing a one bar build nowadays, it seems kind of strange not to use this because it provides you so many additional benefits. So while equipped, you are unable to swap between your primary and your backup weapon sets. So this is going to force you to stay on your front bar. We're going to get Major Berserk, Major Courage, Major Brutality, Major Sorcery, Major Prophecy, Major Savagery, Major Force, Major Protection, Major Resolve. Minor Fortitude, Minor Intellect, Minor Endurance, and Major Heroism. So the benefits here for you as a tank. One, you've got Major Protection. This is going to reduce your incoming damage by 10%. That is huge. We've got Major Resolve, which is going to boost our resistances by almost 6k because we don't have the bar space to slot a Major Resolve skill. We're going to get Minor Fortitude, Minor Intellect, and Minor Endurance, which is going to increase our recoveries by 15%. And then we're going to get Major Heroism, which is going to give us a ton of ultimate back. The reason why getting ultimate back on a Dragonite tank is important is because when we use our ultimate, we're going to get our resources back. And that is an integral part of making this build work, is making sure we're using ultimates as much as possible and we are getting all those resources back so we're able to tank for longer and survive and sustain and do all those things. Now for the traits on this gear. So on the one hander, I've got a charged Poison Glyph. This is a Dragon Knight tank. When you use a charged weapon, this increases the chance to apply status effects. We then used a poison damage glyph. This is going to proc the poison effect on the enemy. When we proc the poison effect on the enemy, this is going to proc the combustion passive. Which, as you can see there, when you apply poison to an enemy, you restore a thousand stamina once every three seconds. Now, this glyph will only proc once every 5 seconds. So once every 5 seconds, we can benefit from 1,000 stamina because of this enchant. By having it charged, it means it's going to have a higher chance to proc the poisoned effect. If we don't use charged, the poisoned effect won't happen as often. And so it's less likely to proc, so we'll get less resources back. This is going to proc from light attacks, heavy attacks, and your pierce armor. So any kind of weapon ability will proc this enchant. We're also going to be using a champion point slottable that is going to make this proc also when we take damage. So that's really, really important to help with Dragon Knight sustain. Next, we've got Sturdy on the shield and all the body pieces. So Sturdy Tristat. I mention this pretty much all the time, but Sturdy is the most valuable trait to use, especially if you are new to tanking, if you are inexperienced, if you are blocking a lot. If you're blocking at any point more than sort of 30 or 40% in a fight, 
Sturdy outperforms every other trait. It's just not worth having any other trait because reducing your block cost has the most value out of all the different traits that you can use. So all sturdy is the most beneficial. I personally like the tri-stat glyphs. You don't have to use those. You can use whatever glyphs you want. So maybe you want more stamina or more magicka. You can adjust your attributes and your, and your glyphs to whatever stats you want to try and achieve. On the jewelry, I'm using three triune magicka recovery. This is to take my stats a bit higher. And the magicka recovery is to give me more resources. On a dragon knight, we're able to convert magicka into stamina, which I'll talk more about in a moment. But that's why we've gone three magicka recovery. You could go infused if you wanted to for even more sustain. But I'm trying to get nice max stats here as well to try and balance everything out so that I'm able to tank with this one bar setup. Now, alternatively, if you didn't want to use the old console ring, you could use a weapon set instead. You could use the Vatishran one hand and shield. The Void Bash set. This is going to help you to chain in enemies easier by doing this. So you could use that. In theory, it's no better to use it on one side of things because if you're using the Vatishran one hand and shield, it takes up two gear slots. And you will also need to slot one skill to proc it. And so by not using it, we need to slot one skill chains. So it kind of... In, in regards to like saving bar space, it's not going to save you any bar space on a one bar build, but it is going to make things slightly easier. Chains is quite reliable anyway, so that's not a huge issue, but you could use the Vatishram one hand and shield instead if you wanted to. Before you get this trial gear, so both of these gear sets are obviously obtained in a trial. You might need to do some dungeon content to get some gear, so you could use Ebon for a start off set, and Worm Cult, which you get from Crypto Hearts is where you find Ebon, and Worm Cult is found in Vaults of Madness. Now, you could also try using Crimson Oath, which drops from the Dread Cellar, another good gear set, which is a dungeon set. And then you've also got the Turning Tide gear set, which is a very, very strong option. That one can be found in Shipwright's Regret. The problem with Turning Tide and Crimson Oath is the micromanagement required. They do need to be procced and activated. So I've avoided using them in this build but it's an option if you want to use them. Instead of using a mythic or a weapon set, you could also use a monster set, but that is up to you. I'll leave that one up to you. You could use something like, if you are using Turn and Tide, you could use Nazare. You could also use Engine Guardian. You could use something like that to give your group another additional buff or to give yourself more resources. Okay, onto the skills. Now, we have got very limited bar space, as I've mentioned, so we need to try and achieve everything we can within the few bar spaces that we've got. Integral, um, for number one, we've got Pierce Armor. It's a taunt skill, and it's going to proc our Yolnukrin gear set. It's also going to debuff the enemy with Major and Minor Breach. So very, very important. Secondly, we've got Choking Talons. We need some kind of crowd control when we're dealing with enemies. In this situation, our only real option is Choking Talons, and it's a good one as well. It is AoE Minor Main reduces all enemies' damage by 5%. It also provides a synergy to the group for more fire damage with the Ignite synergy. It will immobilize enemies for 4 seconds when they're pulled and near to you. So that's quite good as well. So we do get a number of benefits from using this skill. Next we've got Igneous Shield. Now this is a fantastic skill. It's a shield that will shield you and your group members. It scales with your max health. Um, it will proc a number of different benefits. So it gives you major mending when you cast it. It will also proc your passives that are going to give you resources back. So when you use Igneous Shield, you gain 990 stamina back. So this can be used as a spammable skill to provide a shield and also to provide you with stamina. So it's not a bad skill at all to spam. If you've got full Magicka, then you should be hitting this skill. By using shields, it means you need to use less healing and that's very, very beneficial. And it also shields your group as well. So that's nice for your group because it gives them some shielding as well. Next, we've got Coagulating Blood. This has been updated with High Isle. This is now the better morph compared to Green Dragon Blood. Now, the only real difference here is the only additional benefit of Green Dragon Blood compared to this is the minor vitality. But this morph is actually going to heal you for more even without the minor vitality. So, even without the minor vitality bonus, it is actually better to use Coagulating Blood. So, I've done a number of tests. We've run many, many tests for this. Coagulating Blood is the better heal, unless you're under 10% max health. So once you're under 10% max health, 
then Green Dragon Blood is the better burst heal. This is going to heal you no matter what. So with Green Dragon Blood, there is no base heal for Green Dragon Blood. It just heals you based on missing health. This is going to heal you for a base value plus additional healing based on missing health. So we get a 9k heal and 50% of whatever our health that it's missing. So it's a huge heal. We also get major fortitude with this as well, increasing health recovery, which is the same as what you get from using a potion. So this is just, honestly, it's a very, very good heal. It's not going to be wasted. Green Dragon Blood is a bit of a waste. If you use Green Dragon Blood and you have 80% health, you're going to get very little benefit from it. If you use this at 80% health, it's going to heal you back up to full. So it's not got the waste value of Green Dragon Blood, which is really, really nice. And so this is what we're using next. The next skill is Unrelenting Grip. This is how we're going to pull enemies to us. So when you're chaining things in, you use this skill. It's going to pull things in. And we're also going to get a speed boost with Major Expedition. If you use this on a boss, it's going to be a free cast because it refunds the Magicka if it doesn't chain anything. But it also gives you a speed boost. So that's really, really nice. Now, with Crown Control, you need to chain things in and then you need to use Talons to root them in place. That is how we're going to do it. However, on a boss fight, you won't be able to chain and tell on stuff. There's nothing to chain and tell on. So these are both flex skills. These are ad pull skills. These are things that you switch out for more beneficial skills once you get to a boss fight. So once you're on a boss fight, you can use additional skills. You could use Burning Embers, which is going to give you a heal. So it does damage and then heals you for 51% of the damage done. You could use Cinder Storm, which is 370 magicka cost. And it gives you a 2k heal every one second. Not only that, but you can spam it to proc your Helping Hands passive. So it's going to cost 300 Magicka to cast it, and then you're going to get 990 Stamina back. So it's extremely valuable in that situation. If you're somebody who struggles for sustain, just spam Cinderstorm, and you get tons and tons of Stamina back. On a boss fight, you could use Heroic Slash so that you can obtain Minor Heroism to go along with your Major Heroism from your Oaken Soul Ring. If you are having sustain troubles, then you could use Spell Symmetry. You don't need Balance because Balance provides you with... Major Resolve, which you already have from your Oaken Soul Ring. So you could use Spell Symmetry, which is going to give you 3k Magicka back at a cost of 5,000 health, but then it's going to reduce the cost of your next Magicka skill by 33% as well. If you're having real problems, you could use Inner Rage for a Range Taunt as well. So you could switch one of your skills out. In, in fights where you need to, switch out a skill for Inner Rage so that you can Range Taunt stuff. Another good, another good skill is Razor Caltrops, which is a nice AoE debuff. It provides... A snare, it snares the enemy and provides that major breach to enemies as well as an area of an effect. In some fights you might need a fish from purge. That is going to get you um, a nice purge for you and your group, which is going to remove negative effects. And also when you've got this slotted, it is going to give you the magicka raid passive, which gives you 10% more magicka recovery. And finally we've got the last skill, aggressive horn. This is going to give us max magicka and max stamina. And it's also going to give us and our group major force increasing critical damage done. Now, when we use this, we're also going to get a lot of resources back because of our passives, which I'm going to go over in a second. But we use Aggressive Horn. It provides a group buff, but it also gives us all of our resources back. So we want to use this as much as possible. Onto the passives. As I said before, the Combustion Passive in your Ardent Flame skill line, extremely valuable. When you apply Poisoned Effect, you're going to get 1,000 stamina back. We're going to get this with our Charged Poison Glyph one-hander. We're going to proc this very, very often. We're going to proc it on... Every five seconds, if we are activating a skill on those five seconds, and that's going to be really nice for our sustain. The other passives here are not necessary, but you can take them if you want. Draconic Power, Iron Skin, very good. Burning Heart is going to increase our healing received by 12%, which is good because we're using um, two skills here from this skill line. Elder Dragon increasing our health recovery, and Scaled Armor increasing our resistances. The Earthen Heart passives are... Very, very good. So increase the duration of your Earthen Heart abilities by 20%. So Igneous Shield is going to get 20% increased duration. Battle Roar. When you cast an ultimate, you restore health, magic, and stamina for each point of the ultimate's cost. So our ultimate costs 250 ultimate, which means we're going to get an absolute ton of resources back. And this is why it's so valuable. Battle Roar is just one of the keys to sustaining a Dragon Knight. You use your ultimate as much as possible, and you get all those resources back. Mountain's Blessing is our group buff, so we provide our group with minor brutality, increasing their weapon and spell damage by 10%, but we also generate three ultimate once every six seconds. 
So that is really, really nice. So upon casting Igneous Shield, not only are we going to get the benefit of our Helping Hands passive, but we're also going to benefit from Mountain's Blessing. And then, obviously, like I've mentioned already, the Helping Hands passive gives us 990 stamina. So you can use Magicka skills to get stamina back. That is why having really high Magicka recovery is super valuable for a Dragonite, because we can keep spamming Igneous Shield or Cinder Storm to get back this 990 stamina. The one hand and shield passives, all of these are useful. You just take everything here because obviously we're using a one hand and shield, so it is useful to take them all. We are using one light piece of armor here, so you want to take grace. You want to take the first three of your light armor passives. Those are the most important ones. And then for your heavy armor, you want to take everything here as well for the increased resistances, the increased resource gain, and everything that these offer. You should take your Undaunted passives because we do have two types of armor with heavy and light. So we've got 4% more stats and we benefit from the Undaunted command, restoring more resources when we use the Synergy. Obviously take all of your racial passives and then medicinal use from your alchemy is another good one. Okay, for the champion points. Green CP is up to you, but obviously Rationer, Liquid Efficiency, Steed's Blessing, the usual kind of stuff. For the blue CP, you take everything that cannot be slotted, so everything that's going to give you these stats that don't need to be slotted. All of these ones that reduce your damage. And then we want to go with Ironclad. We want to go with Duelist Rebuff. And then for me personally, I've got Bulwark and Cutting Defense. If you need to, you obviously use Enduring Resolve and or Unassailable, depending on the type of damage you're taking in a fight. Cutting defense is especially good for the Dragonite because it's going to proc your weapon enchant on cooldown. So we're going to keep getting our resources back when the enemy hits us. We're going to return damage back to the enemy and then it's going to proc our weapon enchant and then that's going to give us stamina back. So very, very useful to have cutting defense, especially on this build. For the red CP, it's the same situation again. So we, just, we, we take everything that doesn't need to be slotted, but then I've got fortified... I've got Rejuvenation, but you could take Sustain by Suffering for a little bit more. I've got Expert Evasion in there as well to reduce the cost of our dodge roll. And then we've got Ward Master, which redu reduces the damage you take by 10% while blocking and under the effects of a damage shield. So when you're blocking and spamming Igneous Shield, you're going to have 10% damage reduction, which is really, really nice, especially in a case of this build where we've only got one bar, we've only got a limited amount of skills, we're going to probably be casting a lot of Igneous Shield, which means we don't need to worry about too much because we've got the damage reduction from this and all the other sources already. We should be taking very, very small amounts of damage. So that is everything, guys, for this Affinity One Bar Dragon Knight tank build. Hope you've enjoyed the build. Let me know in the comments below what you think and if, uh, if you're going to give this a try. If you've got any questions or anything like that, you can also check out the tankclub.com for more builds and tank information. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye for now.